Hello everybody, welcome to another practicing session number 63, I think, again in the framework of the Beethoven project. That's the project that we are starting and preparing now, we're starting at the end of this year, recording all these solo works uh, of Be from Beethoven on clavichord and the two piano fortes, so the Fritz and the Frenzel here. So three instruments, 60 works over 22 CDs, so in the course of the coming months, sharing with you this practicing, this preparation, so to say, in on our way to that Beethoven project that will last for three years, I think. Today we're going to have a look on the variationen, variations, dirigini variations. So that's one of the earliest works that will be included on this series. And in fact, here's my list, complete list of recordings that I'm going to make. And we are now here. CD number two, I can show you here. Hope you see that. So 24 variations. That will be on a CD with the Paisiello variations, with which we did a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I think, and they're on my channel now as a tryout recording. And then the sonatas, who will guide actually the chronologic order because the sonatas will be the, the, the backbone so to say of the whole series on this cd the second sonata in a major is included so you'll have the variation of paisiello in a major then the sonata number two in a major and then these variations in d major there are different versions but originally beethoven made this work while coming to Vienna in 1791. So they're in the Wiener Urtext is actually set as a date 1790, but that's, this was one of his showpieces in Vienna. And Czerny writes about these variations that it's, it's an important work in Beethoven's oeuvre because people then realize how um, advanced in his way of playing and composition already was when he was uh, nearly 20 years old coming to Vienna. So giving this piece would give a really good impression on what people heard from Beethoven when he first presented himself to the Viennese public. So today, first look, I started a few, actually a few weeks ago, with making fingerings, but that was ended. I only ended up in variation number three. I have a second camera here added, so I will go through that uh, that piece, variation by variation, and we will not succeed in doing them all this session, because this is a really, really long work. Um, 24 variations. In my timing, I have set a timing if I'm not making all the second repeats, 28 minutes. So this is a huge work. It's a really long work as well. Compare, for instance, to the Sonata in A major, which is a little bit later. It's also over 30 minutes. I think even the A major Sonata, I said at 40 minutes, but that's a work, of course, of, with much differentiation. Here, Beethoven gives a proof of his ability to make variations, which was in the time very important. Um, anyway, that's what we're going to do. So pencil and sharpener is all we need. And a metronome, because Czerny did give us a metronome number, which is always cool to check. So before we start, if you want to participate in these live streams or pre-recorded premieres on YouTube, and I get a lot of questions from the notification system on YouTube that YouTube is notifying you too late or even not, they change, they're changing that system. So they make it, if you subscribe to the channel, which I hope you all do, they will not actually feature that, they will not give you a notification, not through mail, not on your mobile device, from the videos I publish, also not from the live streams, which is of course a little bit weird because the live stream is the way to interact with each other, are like a premiere recording like we're having now in the chat. So 
fixing that, what should fix that is go and click on the bell icon and there you can set notifications. But it's important, I think certainly on mobile, you have three options, a few regular or all notifications. So if you set it to all, you will have um, a notification on your mobile device. On computer is just notifying you or not notifying you. And then make sure on your mobile device that your um, a notification system for, I don't know, Facebook messages or other things that, you know, you get crazy from all these beeps and, and rings, that that's actually on, because if that's off, YouTube respects that, then you will not receive notifications. So that's just an in-between um, that I think many of you, um, it, well, you asked me what the notification system is, and I checked it. So it's it's complicated system, but I can understand because if YouTube sends you notifications for everything, for all the things you subscribed for, that would be a total mess in your inbox. Okay, there we go. Let's just check the temperature. Hundred eight. Allegretto. It's kind of normal time signature. Which it's two four. We will see how this unfolds. But I think we can, there is an adagio and Terni does not give the other tempi for this, these variations. But all, overall adagio sostenuto, which is obviously an other notation, way more uh, use of 30, 30, 64th notes actually as well. So that's for later. Then here is a more open structure, we see what we do for that. And it's also Allegro and then a Presto Assai at the end. So Allegretto 108. In whole beat, this would mean Jack and one and two and one and two and one and two. Convert that to um, half beat, so our modern reading. Today that would result in quarter note 154, which is actually very close to the tempo ordinario. Makes sense? And I think for these variations, it's, uh, it's out of question to play this in 108 quarter note. If you've not, if you not know, if you, this is your first time uh, with these tempo issues, then we have made a video that can introduce you for, uh, well, just open this new perspectives of the whole beat interpretation. I think historical one uh, for the metronome numbers. I'll link it here in the info card. So there we go. a second repeat actually here but let's not do that well it's a, well, it's a team the team Beethoven chooses sometimes as well it's not too too interesting but what he makes of that is of course something else then the first variation already rather complex harmony danced harmony so to say sempre dolce well 1790 so remember Mozart still was alive a little bit more perhaps than I should or will do at the end but it's just I've played the Fritz piano so much lately which has a very light action it's different than the Prenzel so it needs I need to absorb that 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 action actually of that piano and coming back to the clavichord makes it sometimes a little bit hard certainly if you have these tricky harmonies where the hand position needs to you know you need to compromise on your hand position so 
arpeggiating sometimes helps you play those notes more purely. I do think though that it's possible here. So notice also how much faster suddenly this feels because of the dense harmonic structure. If you start, it gives a very normal, peaceful pulse, so to say, but suddenly this becomes Ending, eh? Okay, so I'm reading also the fingerings. You know, with the Wiener you know, Old Text, great addition, but I don't like the fingerings to be honest. Certainly not made for a period keyboard. And well, fingerings is an important issue. Not going into detail, I've made that point a lot. It's not only personal, but it reflects the interpretation. If you change a fingering, it's not. It's like changing the tempo changes everything. The changing the fingering doesn't change everything, but it has an impact. The fingering un supports actually the interpretation you make. So prefixing or pre-giving these, these fingerings by someone who might be a great pianist, probably, I mean, they're not going to ask this from Mr. Nobody, so to say, but anyway, that's a, that's a very personal stamp on an edition that claims a certain neutrality. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make some videos on Ur text because there is actually a lot to be said and it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to do that in a nuanced way because in these times, internet times, it seems to be like if you make a point or have an, have an, have a, have an idea that you criticize something, it's very easy from the sideline to do that, but it's important sometimes as well um, to make your point or just, uh, and on Ur text editions I think we can say a lot. Text is great here, so nothing but positive. And then we have a very strange structure. So you have these eight, no, eight notes with a dot, staccato, and then, which is actually, well, 30 second note with, so ta -ta. the question is how you play that. So the accent is on that eight note, that's, underlines completely the whole the theory here because tan rigato, tan rigato, if you play that double as fast then this will be a very awkward counter accent. So how to play that? Tan, ta -da. Give, do we give an accent on the ta -da, or do we preserve the accent for the A? So in fact, you could say this is played literally as it is written, or consider this to be a short appoggiatura, which actually is written out here. And it's an interesting question that I'm asking myself now, because somehow I have the idea, but I should look into this much further and certainly there have been published studies that talk about it but it's, it's hard sometimes because in the historically informed performance practice we tend to play every written out ornament the, the, the chance we have to play it as a short and I don't think that's a practice that goes back to that original times I think many of these written out short ornaments what we call short are actually long or ornamentation but you know pianists were doing that in the 60s and 70s and I've made that point a lot the, uh, the, the start of the historical performance practice, I mean, not the dolmetsch period of around 1900, which were the really true pioneers, I think, but in 1960, 70, there was a need to, you know, um, do things differently. By the nature of doing things differently, by the need of doing things differently, there was before. So if pianists plays 
played long apposaturas, well, why not play them short because they were indexed, indicated like that, or noted, noted like that, but it's not so simple. And here, <coughs> there is a time, I think, where the system of n n notating short apposaturas and um, actually writing the long ones in full is a kind of weird system. If you turn that around, the, the long apposaturas, you can write them in full. And the short ones is difficult, but because then you have this weird, uh, you know, here Beethoven, if this is a short apposatura, Beethoven has used a kind of still recognizable uh, notation system, but you see in, in schools where you have, well, 64 to 128 notes, and then to, to indicate how short they are, but on the beat, an accent went, accent, accent, accentuated, which is hard to do. So, if Mozart would have written this, probably he would have um, just have written the A, and with, yeah, then, yeah, it's difficult to write the F sharp as an appoggiatura, which is a third lower, and he, so this is interesting, this is actually a really interesting topic to go deep in. I think it's a short appoggiatura, and Beethoven is, I think, shifting that system for long appoggiaturas writing in full, but that's just an idea now. So if it's a short appoggiatura, we should try to make the accent on the A. And now piano. Forte. Forte. This works great actually, let's try it again. a little bit shorter. I'm, I'm kind of sight reading, so don't expect these practicing sessions to be finished performances. I'm just actually sharing this, this, I've gone through these three variations a little bit, but I actually didn't play them, so it's, it's a kind of experimenting. There's something really fun to make out of this. If you play that, and typically you, I mean, it's, it's, it, yeah, I have to remember that it is a short apertura because otherwise you're going to play it. It's a little bit, this is more interesting. you can do this so punchy on the pianoforte, even not on the Fritz, which is, we are talking about this yesterday with Joris, he was here to again fine tune the bass, it's amazing how it changes the bass, it, this instrument is becoming really, really, really fabulous. Um, so both instruments are, are, are comparable, the, the Frenzel and the Fritz, but the Fritz is definitely going back more to the beginning of the century, it's close to Walter's piano, pianofortes actually, but no way you can this play the salt. 
jump so punchy like on the clavichord. It's it is irreplaceable in that regard. So variation three. There's a strange C, eh? It's chromatic, so one, two here. Here also A. It just runs. It just runs that D major scale. Regardless of what happens in the right hand, it's actually cool. What fingering do I have here? Okay, so I, I shift to fifth finger every beginning of the bar simply because of the reason that I want to give an accent there and it's, it's, it, it feels good. Actually, kind of with Mozart, you don't find these kind of passages. So chromatic line here, and then Just slow down with him. First read carefully. So also if you want to play much faster than the indicated tempo, then still you have to read carefully. And it just feels awkward. This is C natural. It's Wants to wants to wants to take uh, want to take a C sharp actually. It's ready. It is C. Also here, it's already there. Check the tempo.
So these chromatic lines, we need to study that. So always study slower than you, well, in a tempo that you can read the next note before you play it. So the reading before playing it is the way to practice and well of course you want to make music and so also I am just skipping that that uh, that important part of practicing which is simply allowing your brain to absorb the notes that are written and if you have you know uh, played a lot of music that you have practiced and that you know you can play and then go back and play, practice a new piece your eye needs to adjust to reading in a different way it takes time a little bit so that's a matter of discipline so I have to say to myself I'm going to um, switch the cameras real quick and so we can continue okay variation number four hope this works this is new so with a long trill <laughs> Here will be the um, keeping the trill on the clavichord soft while giving room to the lower voices. down to the A, a little bit out of tune but anyway I, should, I would like to hear this one it's difficult eh? because naturally this this A takes over it's the same note should be the same note so how to do this It's piano, but yeah, you, you, I will have to make my left hand a little bit louder than that. So you need this you need that time to make this sound actually. <laughs> trills with the upper note or the main note, that's I think in case of these long trills. It's often on the main note, I think. In the case of Beethoven, and if you go to Czernis Piano Forte School, there is a transition in that period from mainly a practice from starting with the upper note to the main note. And that's happening in Beethoven's time and also by Beethoven himself. There are some interesting uh, studies that I've read recently done where, on that, comparing these, um, you know, you know Places where Beethoven or Czerny just indicated the way you, would, you should start the trill, and there is a kind of inconsistency there, which is great because we can then that opens the way to decide for ourselves. Well, it's not that easy, of course, but but long trills, yeah, it's it's not something you can say. Well, it's definitely needs to be played like that that's 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 the least i can say about it or i know about it at this moment at this moment <laughs>
So guys, completely sight reading now, so don't um, don't expect again to finish recording. So making sound here is, is not so difficult because the, the treble will sound over the bass, but it becomes more tricky when the, the bass trill comes together with, with the melody. difficult ending because what fingering should we take for the next trill so I play this with 2-1 which I think makes sense because we have to play the G sharp here as an ending but then go one octave higher and we should have a connection to that octave so why not do something unconventional so makes the connection, then going to the B with second finger, third finger, one. The question, the same thing here then. The question that's interesting to solve is whether these people in those days made these trills as fast as we do today. You see these written out trills, you know, with from Bülow and, and even Czerny and Hummel or you, you name it. They all have s passages where you write trills out, even Beethoven. And we tend to say many of those written out trills are very rhythmical and in our eyes really slow. Um, I sometimes think the way Glenn Gold plays these Bach trills, which we say, yeah, well, that's not musical. Well, you can debate if that's Bach's practice. Perhaps not. But it might be something that goes back a long time, a long way. Um, since why would, for instance, Bülow write a trill like... Very rhythmically, but with perhaps a little bit of room for speeding and getting back. But that's the, that's the framework if he wasn't serious about really playing it like that. So yeah, I don't know, it's just a question. Let's just try that actually. Don't have to fast trill here. This is trickier than you might think because all these endings need to be really fine. If you miss an ending, so starting a trill is not so difficult. But then comes a moment where you have to decide when am I going to play that G sharp. So at the same time, you have this very simple rhythm in the left left. Trill, regardless of you start the trill on the upper note or the main note, in many cases has an impair number of um, strikes that you make. So there comes a moment where you have to catch up with what you will have to catch up because if you have nine notes in that in that quarter note here, or yeah. Well, there's a place where you have to play ta ta tam, so it goes a little bit faster. And certainly with long trills, there comes a moment where this that feels very nice. You can hold that forever, but suddenly comes a moment when you have to change 
that feeling. So you see the drill accelerates at the end. But there it stops. So that's harder than you think. You just try that. And I can imagine if you practice that, that if, miss, if you miss a trill, I mean, it's not a problem, but try to make them all clear and exact, because that's, that's actually the, the, the trick here. It's difficult. I would, I would say. Chuck, chuck, try it again. That's a difficulty on the clavichord. So on the piano, well, on the frenzel it's difficult to play trills. On the fritz, that action is so incredibly fine, regulated, that trills are easier. But anyhow, you have more sound production. And if you have a hammer, not only that, actually that's not, 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 not the essence why it's, why it's diff more difficult here to play trills than on the fritz. <clears throat> you have on the piano, um, the energy get give into the key is resulting in a kind of key acceleration so here i think on the piano is one to five clavichord is it's different it's 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 less but anyway the hammer throws you throw the hammer to these to the strings and then it falls back and you get the new impulse so in this room where the hammer is actually given this you know this is an empty space where you don't have control anymore that doesn't happen with the clavichord, so the tangents are constantly hitting the string and remaining there as long as you are not um, allowing the tangents to come down, which happens with your fingers only. And so playing trills is okay, but it's trickier than on the piano, much trickier because you have to make sounds. So it's not only a rhythmical issue, it's only also a matter of making sound with every note of that trill which happens with air arm weight and a little bit of wrist movement. Again, the keyboard, uh, basic course on keyboard techniques, it's in the description box, it tells you, tells you everything about it. But if you have done long trills and certainly at the end with these rhythmical variations, that's the more tricky because you have to change your hand position a little bit. And so it might happen that one of those notes doesn't sound, don't, it just doesn't sound that right, and that is immediately audible. So in conservatory we had for trills in that period the trick to just touch the pedal, the sustaining pedal, a little bit, which is not the practice that they did. They made sound with their fingers. Certainly in that period, that early 1790, there was actually not a real, um, you could say, system of pedaling, and certainly not with, with trills. So it, it's, it's your fingers need to do that. And that pleads actually for that earlier thought we had, or I had, and that 
want to experiment with that for a long time actually to make drills slower because then you have more control and it's nothing to do with tempo I mean um, the drill is uh, it, it, the drill is, is influenced by the basic tempo you, cho you choose but uh, overall um, you can play fast drills in slow movements as well so it's, it's, it's a stand alone thing so to say just, just let's try it again <laughs> The fascination of this piece is, of course, the drill. It works great. It has nothing to do with the tempo choice. I mean, you could say the beginning is slow if you if you think about it. It's very calm, but it gives room to those trills. And if you if it works at the end, you say, "Wow!" It, it, it has a kind of fascinating aspect, I think, for the listener. Then, so triplets here in sixteenth notes, which normally affect the tempo a little bit, unless they are ornament only ornamental only ornamental ornamental I think only so here let's just stick to the tempo and see what don't think there is a tempo change <laughs> That's the kind of Beethoven sound you will not hear often, I think, also not in later works. Again, the same chromatic lines. It sounds like Bartok. If 
we did that in conservatory, it would be wrong. But of course, it's Beethoven, it's not wrong, it's a chromatic line, you can do that. But he, ex he, um, uh, he uh, enhances that effect, he misuses actually that, that chromatic harmonic line to allow him to write an F natural against, almost against the F sharp. It's actually a cool effect. <laughs> Sono? Okay, well, why not? He is, he, such small elements, actually, like here the F natural, and but also here falling suddenly. The bass is, needs to be tuned a little bit. So that's what's, what makes a composer like Beethoven stand out, of course. note and then yeah you cannot escape from doing something here so that's clever that's good the tempo I don't need to make finger here octaves yeah that's always the same so you play if possible with one four on when you have octaves on the black keys here, the upper keys, I would say. If that's not possible, you take one five, but... So remember also that you have to double this speed if you want to play it in half beat which is of course the essence of the discussion if you yeah claim that is the way to read these metronome numbers you don't have to you have to play accordingly it's very fast here <laughs> is to hold the notes long enough which is a little bit against the nature of the of the movement but that's the trick if you, if you make it too short to um, accelerate the releases in order to to hit the next note quick enough then you will have a very ugly sound this doesn't work play this tomorrow again I will lose this um, this passage I will have to re-study that a little bit it's, it's it's a matter of getting the notes in, in in your system of course so let's just do one more one variation I think it's yeah it's a long work we might have to spend some weeks on this so go piano okay oh yes like that, it's true. So five, five, 
five three but what are we going to, uh, what are we going to do then two one yes so then we can change fingers here to four one which is a little bit more classic two one three one is not something you would do easily but here i don't know actually Five, three, four, two, definitely. Let's see what the left hand was. Let's do that. I mean, let's be progressive here. Because of the left hand, it's easier when the left hand just sticks to that. Because remember, you have to play it very equal to each other, you know? One, two. Five, three, two, one. Here we come on three, five, and we continue with two, four. I'd say well this is not necessary to write down these fingerings that might be true but once you do once you take your time to just think about them there is one fingering that feels best and once you have noted this down you don't need to think about it anymore and often said my experience is you will learn the piece much quicker. Yeah, I need something unconventional. One, two. Yeah, between the black, the upper keys. New. Okay, check my cameras here. Second time the cameras is for me assigned to uh, wrap the session up. It's an hour doing this with you here, just with these microphones, actually, it's, it's, it's me alone. It's nothing, in fact. It's, it, I, I enjoy these, these little things. I mean, fingerings, making fingerings is boring in a way. And I really don't like it because it's, it's, it's a necessary step, you know, in the process. But you want to skip that because you want to play the music. But if you just do it, it feels like opening... Um, you know, when you have a nice car, you open the motor and, and I wouldn't do that because I don't know anything about it. But it's for people who know something about cars, it's interesting to dive into the details of the motor, the engine, how the car works and the specifics. When you make fingerings, that same happens diving into the music. So it's worth your time and it's more than worth your time. It will speed up the, your practicing process. If you leave this piece alone for some years and you take it back, it repracticing will just go that much faster. Five to its obvious. One four. One three. One five. Again four three. Same. Okay. Yeah, 
that perhaps this is not necessary to write down but also here so this variation is full of exceptions so also here that is a, that's a position you don't take on the clavichord too often Actually, nice to set at the clavichord back because this, you feel the string. The string is your, it holds your notes. I mean, don't go deeper, but it, it feels so good actually to have this natural. What do you say that? Uh, border. It's not border. Or. staccato and five four. let's see how this sounds as a closure for this session so sometimes it is a little bit irregular it has to do I've shown that but I need to fix that so but it gives unbelievable accurate time the tempo So it's nice these effects of thirds over octaves. It gives a full sound. Mm. I don't like this. Three one. So imagine this play double as fast. There's no need for Beethoven then to write these slurs with a staccato mark, so that's double. So only the slur would mean the same, but he really wants to have a second eighth note short. Um, so not to connect it in a cantable way, so to say. If you play a double, I mean, it's only, that's, yeah. Not much to say about that, actually. Yeah, it's number, this was number six, so 18 variations to go. That's for next time. Uh, and then we have all of this to go. Isn't that really exciting? Um, well, just to look forward to this music, to be able to study that and play that and eventually record that as well. So, this all thanks to you guys for being here watching the videos I make, encouraging me to continue. And actually that's unbelievable. There is Sophie looking if she can enter the room. So we have to finish because they will enter soon. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this session. It was a little bit of, you know, these making fingerings first looks at pieces. Sessions are a little bit, uh, how would I say, they jump back and forth between making fingerings, trying things out, first reflections. So it is a little bit, you know, um, improvised as well. But I hope and I get the reaction that it's true that for you this is also interesting because you, 
are sitting next to me literally when I am sight reading and looking to that into this music for the first time. So taking you along with me for this journey. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, subscribing, hit that bell icon with all the notifications if you want to stay uh, notified or keep it in the, get a notification from YouTube for the live streams and these practicing sessions. And for my patrons, I thank you all because you make this possible. And if you're not already a Patreon, there is a link here and in the description box. I would really appreciate you checking that out. And for now, that was it. Thanks for watching and see you soon again.